excited about tonight's show as we have someone I have wanted to speak to for such a long time. Eric John Phelps joining us live from Pennsylvania in the United States. Brother Eric, as he refers to himself, is the author of Vatican Assassins. We are very grateful to have you with us um, tonight live on um, Finding Voices Radio. Um, we at Freedom Central have been following your work uh, to a certain degree, um, in fact, quite intently for some time now. And I myself visit your website, VaticanAssassins.org, Vatican very often, and I check out just about everything you have to say. So it is a real honor for me to be with you. And um, again, um, I'm looking forward to, tonight, to tonight's interview because I have so many questions that I want to ask you. Wonderful. That sounds like uh, we'll have a wonderful time, Melanie. Awesome. All right. So um, just before we get started um, and dealing with all the fascinating information, um, which of course forms the basis of your research and your books, um, first I would like for you to tell us and the listeners a little bit about uh, the journey that took you uh, down this road where you are now communicating this information. Well, it um, started way back in 1963 when... Um, I was a boy, I was 10 years old in the fourth grade. And I remember the day my teacher came in, Miss Beals, who I loved terribly. And she was crying and uh, sobbing and said, the president's been shot, the president's been shot. And that deeply traumatized me. So that, um, from there, that made me want to find out what really happened, because I can remember then as a boy, shortly thereafter, with LBJ when he was sworn in on the Air Force One with the Roman Catholic missive, uh, not a Bible, that uh, he looked guilty. And I said to my father, I said, you know, he looks guilty. And my dad said, uh, well, he doesn't look right. But that, be that caused my first uh, real concern about the way things are. And when I was at Bible College in Clarkson, Pennsylvania, I went to a garb school, a general association, or even a Baptist. I uh, had a history teacher there. His name was Reverend Carter, Dr. Carter. He'd gotten his PhD when he was like 24 or so from Edinburgh in Scotland. So he was very, very proud of that fact. But uh, nonetheless, he had a class on the assassination of Lincoln and he had a long bibliography. And you know, one, of the, one of the books that he showed that the Jesuits were behind the assassination of Lincoln was... Uh, a book written called The Suppressed Truth about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln by Burke McCarty. And she was a godly American woman. She'd been a Roman Catholic. She was saved. And uh, then she did a seven-year study and put out her book in 1924. Her name was Burke McCarty. Yeah. B-U-R-K-E McCarty. I have it in my, it in my bibliography, in my book. And she showed in her book that the Jesuits were the true assassins of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, all the reasons why the secret treaty of Verona, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that deeply affected me. So I thought, now, what if it's the Jesuits or the ones that are behind the Kennedy assassination? Because if they would kill Lincoln, why? If they, if they, should, if they would kill Lincoln, they would kill Kennedy. Well, that opened up my desire to want to start this study. So I, I started this study in about 1980, 1981. I, Left Lancaster Bible. I left uh, Clark Summit Baptist Bible College in '79 after the first two years, and I finished my last two years in Lancaster Bible College. And from there, the Lord led me to some other books. And one of the books was the The, the Footprints of the Jesuits by R. W. Thompson. He was the, one of the past secretaries of the Navy. He was Navy back in the 1800s, and he showed how the Jesuits had assassinated several monarchs. He showed, their, he, he showed how the Jesuits developed communism under Paraguayan reductions. Um, he, he went through their history of their height of power, their suppression by the Pope, their revival of the class of seven. And so I learned more from this, but he, he got tremendously into the Napoleonic Wars. And I began to put two and two together with these Napoleonic Wars, and I thought, is this coincidence or is this design? Everything Napoleon did punished the enemies of the Jesuits. When he, uh, when he uh, attacked Austria, he was attacking the, uh, Maria Teresa, 
who was involved in kicking the Jesuits out of Austria in 1774. When he attacked Spain, overthrew the monarchy, he was attacking the Bourbons who suppressed the Jesuits, kicked them out of Spain in 1767. When he attacked the Portuguese, when he attacked the Braganza dynasty there, drove the Braganzas into South America, he was attacking the Portuguese for their suppression and expulsion of the Jesuit order um, in 1759. This is not just out of Portugal, but it's out of all the Portuguese holdings of South America. It's not just Spain, it's from all the Spanish holdings of South America. And it's not just France, because you see France expelled the Jesuits in 1764. Well, the French had expelled the Jesuits from all their holdings in North America, which would later include what, what Jefferson purchased, called the Louisiana Purchase. And with Jefferson's purchase of that, then the Jesuits didn't have to leave. So all these things happening. Then finally, uh, the, the, Pope, the Napoleon attacks uh, the Knights of Malta on the island of Malta, drives them off the Malta, off the island, takes all their weapons and treasures, and, and this happens 30 years after the Knights of Malta, the Grand Master, expelled the Jesuits in 1768. Napoleon attacks in 1798. And so, and then finally the Pope, he had suppressed the Jesuit order with a papal bull, uh, Dominic Aquedemptor Noster in 1773, and just as Clement V had suppressed the Templars in 1312, Clement XIV suppressed the Jesuits, the New Templars, really, in 1773. And so as a result, what does Napoleon do? Well, he sends General Berthier to Rome, and they capture Rome, they capture the Vatican, take the Pope as a prisoner, Pius VI is a prisoner, he dies. Later, Pius VII is Napoleon's prisoner for nine years, from 16, uh, or for five years, from 16... Uh, from, uh, from 1809 to 1814 until the Jesuits used their King George III to liberate Napoleon and bring him back to the Vatican in 1814. So all these things Napoleon is doing, he's, he's the great Jesuit avenger punishing all the enemies of the order for them during the Napoleonic Wars. So I was putting this together, and then I read a book called Emmanuel Joseph, is Emmanuel Joseph's work called FDR and the Federal Reserve and the Rockefellers or pardon me, the, the Rockefellers in the Federal Reserve. And in that book, Emmanuel Josephson, this brilliant Jew, he's a medical doctor, he talks about Napoleon being the avenger for the Jesuit order. And that's the first time I read it anywhere. And it's after that the Lord had helped me figure this out when I was in, uh, in uh, Bible college there in, uh, in Lancaster. So with this understanding that the Jesuits control Napoleon, they also control King George III, now I'm coming to the realization that the Jesuits are in, on, on the sides of all opposing forces, beginning no later than the French Revolution, Napoleonic Wars. Well, if I thought, well, if this is the case, well, then could it be the Jesuits run the Republican and the Democratic Party? Could it be the Jesuits ran the press? Could it be that they indeed killed Kennedy because Kennedy was an enemy of Cardinal Spellman and his and his Spellman's war, they called it Spelly's War in Vietnam? Could it be because Kennedy refused to allow Spellman to say mass in the White House, Spellman oversaw his assassination? I mean, could it be that because Kennedy sought to do away with the Federal Reserve Bank, which is the Polish Federal Reserve Bank, could it be then that they killed him for this? Could it be because Kennedy put, put silver certificates in circulation that could not be taxed, and we paid no no money for the use of these service certificates, could it be that they killed him for that? I mean, could it be that he sought to break the CIA to a thousand pieces? The CIA is nothing more than the Pope's uh, Nazi SS retransplanted here in America. I mean, could it be all these things? So, with this understanding, as it began to, could it be that because Cardinal Spellman controlled the Mafia, like Lucky Luciano and the others, I have evidence that Lucky Luciano was a dear friend of John J. Raskob, the Knight of Malta who built the Empire State Building? I mean, could it be that the Knights of Malta are also involved with the Mafia, and indeed these Knights of Malta were all in critical places of assassination at the time uh, in Dallas, in, uh, at 1230? in 1963, November 22nd, I mean, the, the head of the Dallas Morning News it was a night of all, so that's why they wouldn't put the story out of what really happened. The, the, uh, the bishop of Dallas-Fort Worth, Thomas Kiley Gorman, was another night of Malta. All these nights of Malta falling in place. The guy who was in charge of t taking the limousine back to, to, the, uh, uh, to the place to get all the primary strikes eliminated, the man who oversaw that was Lee Iacocca, night of Malta head of the Dearborn Division at the time of Ford Motor Company. I mean, and he's still living. He's still living. So all these Knights of Malta showing up, 
in critical places of power. Frank Shakespeare, head of CBS. Um, you got uh, Carthur Deloach, third in command of the FBI, which I maintain he really ran the FBI, ran Division 5. You have uh, James J. Raleigh, who was the head of the Secret Service. His brother Francis was a Jesuit priest. I mean, all this is all this is completely falling into place, overseen by Cardinal Spellman, he running his American branch of the Knights of Malta. So with this understanding, that's why I wrote the book. It took me um, it took me 25 years to do the research. It took me seven years to write it, and three years to finally revamp it and have my third edition, where I nearly tripled its size. In that Revelation 17 is describing the city of Rome that sits on seven hills, and in verse 18 it says, "In the great." The woman which thou sawest is that great city which ruleth over the kings of the earth. And this brings into the reality of the Pope's temporal power. You see, the Vatican is nothing more than a geopolitical empire masked in Christianity, which is really ancient mystery battle on religion. That's all it is. The Pope is Nimrod. He is really the continuation of the Roman Caesars. The College of Cardinals is nothing more than the ancient Roman Senate. And their whole purpose is to create a world government under a Pope of their making, which the Jesuits bring to power and keep in power, so that the final Pope of Rome is going to be murdered, he's going to rise from the dead, and he's going to be the Antichrist, the man-beast, in Revelation 13, verses 3 through 10, Daniel chapter 7, verse 11. This is the end game for human history. And so when I saw that Kennedy was assassinated, it was for one reason. They were upholding the Pope's temporal power. John Kennedy was considered to be a usurper, and therefore he was put to death pursuant to the doctrines of Francisco Sorez in his work, uh, Des Regi, and Sedition is just to kill kings who do not uphold the temporal power of the Pope. And so this further verified Revelation 17. Wow. Surely that's, uh, that's incredible. Okay, um, so you obviously are then very aware that um, Adam Weissopt was said to have been the person who started the Illuminati. Now, was the Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt at the time, This is there's a lot of confusion, was the Illuminati actually something other than the Jesuits, or was he actually a Jesuit who then formed another order because at that time the Jesuits were suppressed? That's right. That's exactly right. You see, the Jesuits were suppressed, and General Ritchie said that no man can relieve you of your vows. So they just went underground, and they formed new organizations like the Fathers of the Faith and, and other orders that they would find. They, I, I maintain they're, they're the original founders of the Assumptionists. Wherever you find an Assumptionist, you find Jesuits. For example, the Assumptionists were involved in spreading the lie that Dreyfus was the one who betrayed France, giving military secrets to Germany. When it was not Dreyfus, it was Esterhazy. But the Assumptionists ran in the paper, and they were promoting this Jesuit doctrine of blaming the Jews. So the Jesuits assumed other names, but one of the one of the names they also assumed, or the organizations that they created on May first, seventeen seventy six, was the Bavarian Illuminati. Remember, the Illuminati is born out of Roman Catholic Jesuit stronghold, Southern Germany, Bavaria, the same place from which came that horrible Thirty Years' War that killed half the German population, and the second Thirty Years' War, which I call in my book. Uh, from 1914 to 1945, World Wars I, two Bolshevik Revolution, Spanish Civil War, all part of the Jesuit or Second Thirty Years War. So, yes, Weishaupt was a Jesuit co -injured. He was not a priest, but he was a Jesuit brother, and uh, he had been teaching canon law, which includes Aquinas' doctrine that it's no murder to kill a heretic. So he was teaching canon law at Ingolstadt College there in Bavaria, which was not far from the Archbishop of Munich. And if you go to, to uh, uh, Bavaria today, you can go to the Ingolstadt College or University, you can go to the Jesuit Church, St. Saint, Saint Michael's Church, and uh, St. Michael's Church is just a stone's throw from the, the Archbishop of Munich, and it was the Archbishop of Munich who, uh, at the time of Hitler, really brought Hitler to power. So this, this is a tremendous place of Jesuit power. Remember, Bavaria is the stronghold of the Vatican north of the Alps. And that's out of Bavaria that the Illuminati was created for, for one purpose, and that was to import the French Revolution into France, to overthrow the French king, because Louis XVI was the grandson of Louis XV, and Louis XV 
1764 at the behest of Madame de Pompadour, expelled the Jesuits from France. So it was vengeance, a day of vengeance. They were going to punish the Bourbons of France for this, and they used the Bavarian Illuminati to do it via Jesuitized uh, Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Wow. And of course, this is a, when they, um, they guillotined um, uh, Marie Antoinette, and uh, the inventor, I think, he was a Jesuit, wasn't he, of the guillotine? Yeah, that's right. He was a doctor and he was a Jesuit coadjutor. He was also a Grand Dorian Freemason. And uh, he invented the guillotine because the Jesuits know that when you cut off people's heads, they're dead. This is how they instructed the Guarani Indians in Paraguay, in the Paraguayan reductions, to kill any white man that would come to their reductions because uh, the Jesuits did not want to know that, let the monarchs of Spain and Portugal know of the huge, massive, commerce that they were conducting out of South America with their black ships, making billions every year. They did not want the kings of Portugal and France to know this. And so beheading is their favorite way, and so they did a lot of beheading in France at the time of the French Revolutions, killing their enemies with the Jacobins, because the Jesuits ran the Jacobins. Okay, so let's just uh, put this all into perspective for people who are not completely aware. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Brother Eric, please take us through the true power structure and how it all fits together, um, and the Jesuits particularly into the Roman Catholic Church. Are, do the Jesuits control the Pope? Yes, the Jesuits control the Pope, and any Pope that seeks not to be controlled by them will be removed one way or another, usually by assassination. Like uh, Clement XIV, when Pope Clement XIV suppressed the Jesuits in 1773, he was poisoned about a year later. They gave him a keta, and that's a poison that you can give to somebody, and depending how much you give to them will determine how quickly or how slowly they will die. And they slow poisoned the Pope, and he died a horrible, gruesome death. It was so bad that they couldn't have an open casket for his funeral. And so uh, that's what they did. The Pope's, uh, the Pope's skin turned black, his hair fell out, his fingernails fell out, his intestines exploded, left a horrible gas in the, in the embalmer's chamber. They had to flee. It's horrible. And so this is what they did to Clement XIV as a message to any other Pope that wants to suppress them. Well, uh, John Paul I sought to remove Pedro Rupi from being the head of the Jesuits. And so therefore, John Paul I was poisoned. And there's a book that was written by Avro Manhattan called, called uh, Murder in the Vatican. You can read the full account. So they control the papacy, lock, stock, barrel. They control all the orders, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Benedictines. They control them all. The, Je the, the Dominican general must kiss the ring of the black pope of the Jesuit superior general. It's like the redemptorist general and the uh, and the uh, and all the other, the Vincentians, you name it. They all must submit to the Jesuit general. And he has Jesuits within every order. He has Jesuits within the Old monarchy. They have the they have the most extant intelligence community in the world. The Jesuits not only run the Vatican and they are and uh, Prodeo, which is their intelligence operation, but the Jesuits run every intelligence agency in this world. They're all tied together by the Knights of Malta and the Knights of the Equestrian Order at the Vatican. So the Jesuit general is the most powerful man. Then underneath him comes his ten assistants. And those ten assistants with the general are advised by ten, um, what's what my friend the Count of uh, Count uh, Vittorio Vivaldi calls the great Jesuits, and they're the ten Roman families, uh, the historic papal Roman families that advise the Jesuit general. And these are the Borgi, Borgias and the Farnese's and the Colonnas uh, and the Albertinis. It's ten of these families. And uh, they act as advisors. They're the one that control all the currencies and all the gold of the world. The Rothschilds are mere peons can can, uh, compared to these ten Roman families. Uh, so you have then the, the Roman families advising the black pope, and then underneath him, then you have um, the, the pope and the entire Roman hierarchy. And that's one arm of it. The other arm of it is all Scottish Rite Freemasonry, all the Masonic Lodges, all of them are completely now controlled by the Jesuits. Then underneath that, then you have the various agencies like the Council of Foreign Relations and Chatham House there in London. Um, um, so everything else kind of trickles down. Remember, the Illuminati was started by Weishaupt, and he went into alignment with the, with the Sabbateans, with the Frankists, which were Jews. Masonic Jews loyal to the Pope. Jacob Frank was baptized 
in the Catholic Church, church and his sponsor was the king of Poland. He sought to have all of his Jewish followers convert to Roman Catholicism. So all the Masonic Jewish labor Zionists are busy being either covert or overt Roman Catholics. Men like Abraham Foxman, who is the head of the ADL. He is a Jew, a racial Jew, but a Roman Catholic, a practicing Catholic, and a Knight of Malta. And the whole purpose for the ADL is to create anti-Jewish fury in America. So uh, the ADL, in fact, gives an award, the, the, the Augustin Cardinal Bia Award. And Augustine Cardinal Bia was one of the foremost Jesuits of the 20th century. He was a confessor of Pius XII. He helped foment the, the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust in Europe. And the ADO gives an award named after him. <laughs> but what you see then, everything flows down from the top, from the Jesuit general through the Pope. But the whole purpose of the Jesuits, remember, they are the, um, they are, it's the Roman uh, guard for the Pope. The black pope is the Roman praetor. The Jesuits are, are considered the obsidian order. They are the praetorian guard to keep the pope in order and keep him on track <clears throat> because it's the devil's pope that's to be brought to world power and finances, in, in government, in politics, in academia, ultimately to be worshipped from a third Hebrew temple in Jerusalem. Now, um, do we have any idea when this is uh, prophesied to happen? No. No, we just know that there will be a third Hebrew temple built, pursuant to Daniel 9, verse 27, Matthew 24, 15, uh, yeah, Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, that's, that's a literal, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, there's going to be a literal temple of God, a literal rebuilt Hebrew temple in Jerusalem, in which this Antichrist will set up his statue with his false prophet, his false prophet will be a Jew, and uh, the Jewish false prophet will set up a, a, a statue to talk and move in this third temple. And everybody that doesn't worship the statue of the beast will be attempted, will be put to death. Or at least the Antichrist will attempt to put him to death. And then this Antichrist that I call the man beast, the Revelation 13, uh, 3, 3 through 10, he will also be the king of Babylon. There's going to be a rebuild Babylon, and he will rebuild a temple there pursuant to Zechariah chapter 5. And there will be the commercial capital of the world. And now we understand why there's a war in Iraq. This is nothing more than urban renewal for the rebuilding of the temple in Babylon. Wow. Okay. So let's talk a little bit now. You've brought in the uh, sort of the Jewish aspect um, with this information. Let's talk about, um, obviously, the Zionists. That's, uh, they, they report to the black pope. They're controlled. They're, they're Catholic controlled Jews. That's correct. Now let's, let's review the Zionists. There's six different kinds of Zionists. There is the, I call it in my book, the Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists. Now these Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists are a creation of the Jesuits by way of the Fabian Socialists in England who were really the creators of the British Labor Party. British Labor is nothing more than English... Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists. So it's out of the British Labor Party that we have the Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists arising. Uh, Theodore Herzl was a Pope servant Jew. He had an audience with the Pope. He wanted Jews to become Catholics. Theodore Herzl was a traitor to his own people. He never really wanted them to have their own nation. They, all they wanted was a Jewish state so that there would be Jews in the land to serve as buffer so that ultimately the third temple could be built. So these are the Masonic Jewish labor Zionists. They're utter traitors to their own people, and they work for the Pope. Shimon Peres is a papal court Jew. Benjamin Netanyahu is the papal court Jew. Uh, uh, Rabin was a disobedient papal court Jew because he did not want Jerusalem to be an international city, and so uh, the Shin Bet, controlled by the Pope, put him to death. These are the Masonic Jewish labor Zionists. Now you have also, they're called the the revisionist Zionists. The revisionist Zionists were, were true uh, patriotic Jews who wanted a nation for themselves. And this, was, this group was led by, his nickname was called the Lone Wolf, uh, Vladimir Jabotinsky from Poland. And he sought to bring Polish Jews to, to the Middle East, to Palestine, to be populated. But he was forbidden. He was not allowed to do that. And uh, David Ben-Gurion said, the vast majority of Jews in Poland are going to be killed. 
Remember, Ben Gurion was a Jewish Masonic Jew serving the Pope. Dear friend of James Angleton, that night of Malta, who was the head of the Israeli desk and the Vatican desk when he was chief of counterintelligence in the CIA. So we have these these uh, these um, revisionist Zionists. The leaders were good; they were truly patriotic. Well, Vladimir Jabotinsky just happens to be murdered in Hunter, New York, and that was the end of the of the revisionist Zionists. The revisionist Zionists were big with the Irgun. The Irgun were were the were the Jews who really wanted to stay for themselves, and they had to fight Haganah, and Haganah was run by the Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists. Ultimately, the Ergon is absorbed into the Haganah, and there can be no really any attempt for a true nation anymore. Then you have the Orthodox Zionists. The Orthodox Zionists teach that, that there will be a new a nation of Israel. This is the Orthodox Jewish Zionists, the Jewish Orthodox, I should say. And they teach you that there will be a nation of Israel, but that the Jews in the land have no right to the country at this time, and that's why these Orthodox Jews align themselves with the Muslims. And so they, the Jews have no right to be there. That's what they say. Well, this is not true. This shows you that Orthodox Jews don't believe their own scripture. Because the scripture clearly teaches that there will be an Israel back in their own land in a condition of a temporary peace prior to the nation, uh, prior to the national repentance of New Israel, which we read about in Zechariah chapter 10, 12 verses 10 that they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall weep for him. So there will be a day of national salvation for all Israel, but before that has to happen, there has to be an Israel regathered. For, for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back a second time to Jerusalem and punish all the nations that come against Jerusalem, there must be a Jerusalem inhabited by Jews. For before Israel can enter into the seven-year agreement with the final pope of Rome, this, this Roman Caesar, the prince that shall come, of Daniel 9, 26, there has to be an Israel in existence. So therefore the Masonic, the, the Orthodox Zionists, are, they don't know their own scriptures or they're denying them. So they're of the devil too. So you got the Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists, the Revisionist Zionists, the Orthodox Zionists, then you have the Christian Zionists. The, I used to be one. The Christian Zionists are for the government of Israel, and they are for the Jewish people having their, their, their living in their land. Well, this is an error. This is this is the typical uh, Hagee position. This is the Billy Graham position because all these guys are busy serving the Pope too. They are backing the government of Israel, which is controlled by the Pope. This is a sin. These are the Christian Zionists. They don't differ between the government run by the Pope, and the people whose right it is to live in their land, pursuant to Genesis 15, when God gave the, a racial right of the physical seed of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, not through Ishmael, but through Isaac, through Jacob, for them to live in their land. It is their land. They, ha they alone have a right to that land. So therefore, these are the Christian Zionists. They're wrong about back in the government. They're right about back in the people's right to their land. Now there's what I call, what I classify myself as a Calvinist Zionist. Uh, we believe that the Jewish, Jewish Israelites people have the right to their land. We defend their right to the exclusion of all others to live in that land. We believe that the Arabs should be peaceably removed to the surrounding Arab nations because they don't have a right to live in that land. There's no such thing as Palestinians. There's no such thing as an ancient state of Palestine. That's all revisionist history. However, we, Calvinistic scientists, are totally against the government of Israel. We do not believe uh, that it has a right to govern the Hebrew Jewish Israelites people because it's controlled by the Pope. King Juan Carlos is one of the major players in telling Benjamin Netanyahu what to do. King Juan Carlos is the king of Spain, as you know. He's a knight of Malta. He's a knight of the Equestrian Order. He's a knight of the Austrian Golden Fleece or Spanish Golden Fleece. He is one of the most powerful men in Europe. He tells the government of Israel what to do on orders from the Pope, on orders from the Black Pope. So we Calvinist Zionists are against the government of Israel, but for the people's right to their land. It says five. And the sixth one is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, Yeshua HaMashiach, his Hebrew name, and he is the one who's going to bring peace to Zion. And he is the true Zionist who will return at the end of the seven-year week, the end of the Great Tribulation that will last for three and a half years, it will come back in righteous vengeance, 
and then he will institute his millennial kingdom, his thousand year reign on earth, and he will finally bring peace to Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem. Okay. All right. So that's the Jewish perspective. Now, of course, um, this is very controversial and this gets me into lots of trouble, but it's very important for us to tackle it. It's uh, this information of yours, Brother Eric, that um, where I learned about this, um, the Muslim perspective. And of course, uh, the, the Islam was a creation of the Vatican. Could you take us through that in detail and how you've come to know about this? Yes, um, first of all, my two authorities, first of all, is Alberto Rivera, the ex-Jesuit Rivera, when he put out that comic book form pamphlet by Chick Publication, and he showed that Islam was a creation of the Vatican. Then as I uh, studied it out, I saw the parallels were identical. Uh, the, Vatican, the papacy has a common language. Its specific language is Latin. Islam's specific Latin is uh, Arabic. The papacy has a center city, Rome. Islam has a center city, Mecca. The papacy wages crusades. The Islam wages jihads. Uh, the papacy believes in, in, in no separation of church and state, that the Vatican will control the government of a country. Islam believes in no separation of church and state, that Islam and Sharia law will control the government of a country. Um, and both religions are salvation by works. You must do what it tells you to do to be accepted by God. In contrast to the Bible, salvation is by grace through faith and not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. So, why did the Vatican, and we have to remember that the Pope received his spiritual power in 606 at the hand of the Emperor of the Eastern Empire, Phocas, who was a bloody murderer and killer. He gives the Bishop of Rome his universal spiritual power in 606. In 610, Islam, for the most part, is created. And, the, and there are many things in the Quran that, that parallel the Bible. The Mahdi is really the Antichrist of the Bible. Um, there's many, many parallels. And this means that, that the ones who wrote the Quran had a knowledge of the Bible. The purpose was for the Quran, I believe. The primary purpose was three of them. The purpose first being to alienate the, the dear Arab people. Because remember, there's only two races of people that have biblical promises. The racial Jews and the racial Arabs. Isaiah 19. Any, no other race of people has biblical promises. So therefore, it's in the Vatican's interest to kill as many racial Jews and racial Arabs as possible. So, one of the things they did was they raised up Islam to blind the dear Arab people from the true gospel. And Islam was used by Muhammad to kill out the true Bible-believing Christians, the non-papal Christians, and I don't believe Roman Catholics, I never considered them to be Christians. Uh, they, the papacy kills off the, the Bible-believing Christians of Arabia, and that general vicinity, and the Jews of, North, of uh, Arabia. And then later on with the Jihad, Islam is used to kill off all the non-Catholic Christianity of North Africa while they don't touch all the Augustinian priests and the Augustinians tutor Muhammad. So is and then Islam goes up into Spain. What is Spain? What, what do they do there? They kill off the Arians that were non-Roman Catholic Christians. Now I believe there's some of their doctrines and scripture, but they were not loyal to Rome. So they're going to use Islam to occupy Spain for 700 years to do away with this with this uh, group of Christians that was um, had a great antipathy towards the Vatican. So Islam is going to be used to kill non-Roman Catholic Christians. And now we understand why Islam was used to kill Orthodox Christians. That's why Islam was used by the Pope to take Jerusalem away from the, from, uh, the, the, the Empire of the East in, uh, when Caliph Omar took uh, Jerusalem. And he then uh, erects the, 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 the Dome of Omar, the Mosque of Omar, the Temple Mount. Uh, later on, uh, the Muslims will be used to take Constantinople from the Orthodox peoples. In 1453, Orthodox, Constantinople will fall to the delight of Rome. Everything is, uh, there was a time I believe Islam was not under the control of Rome, but since about the, well, probably since the 1500s, Rome has been controlling. Islam and uses it to kill her enemies. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's how we understand the Vatican using Islam uh, during World War II when they used Bosnian Muslims to kill Orthodox Serbs and Jews during World War II, right along with the Croatian Yastashi, that were all Roman Catholics led by Franciscans. 
Islam is the sword of the church, nothing more. And it's the sword of the church for people of color, namely Arabs and blacks. The same religion for whites is Roman Catholicism. It's mystery Babylon religion for people of color. And at the moment, um, how is that playing out? Um, I mean, we, there's a lot of uh, conflict on various uh, world stages going on at the moment. Um, how does that play out in favor of the Vatican with regards to what is going on in current world affairs um, with the, on the Muslim front and the so-called Jewish Zionist front? Okay, we, have to, we have, always have to distinguish between <clears throat> the Muslim Sunnis, the Sunnis, and the Shia. The Shia arose after the death of Muhammad and they followed Ali. And so you now have two factions of Islam primarily. The Sunnis hate the Shia. The Sunnis consider the Shia to be infidels. No Shia Muslim is allowed to go to Mecca. They hate them. And so it's Rome's design to eliminate Shia Islam. It's happening right now with the war in Iraq, war in Afghanistan, and soon to be war in Iran. Iran is the heart of Shia Islam. In Tehran, which is the capital of Iran, there is not one Sunni mosque. So therefore, the papacy is busy using its Amer American crusaders and NATO crusaders, all run by the Knights of Malta. Remember, the man who fomented the, the war uh, into Afghanistan was George J. Tenet. George J. Tenet was a Knight of Malta with his propaganda of slam dunk and, and uh, weapons of mass destruction for Iraq. But Afghanistan was invaded on October 7th in 2001. October 7th is the great day of the Battle of Lepanto, when the Knights of Malta in 1591 defeated the forces of the Muslims and opened the way for Catholics to begin to, to be, to be quote-unquote pilgrims back into the Holy Land. So it just so happens that this, this, this most important date of the sea battle, the Battle of Lepanto, is considered the second most important sea battle in world history, the first being the Battle of Actium, when uh, Rome defeated uh, Cleopatra in 31 BC. But now we see this war against Shia Islam, which the Pope is using the American military to conduct. And also, we have to include the Israeli IDF, because the attack into southern Lebanon was the killing of Shia Muslims in southern Lebanon. Knowing all the way, all the, this time that uh, the uh, Hamas and all these groups are controlled by the Knights of Malta. So it's a war against the Shia. Once the Shia are sufficiently killed out of, out of Iraq and Iran, then the war will be directed against <clears throat> certain of the Sunnis, and the Sunnis then will unite against all Americans worldwide. And part of this war, the war will extend into the destruction, I believe, of Mecca, Medina, and the Temple Mount Mosque. And this destruction will be blamed on America. This will unite the entire Muslim world. They're going to want to kill every American that they can find worldwide, and they will be the great leaders, the great the soldiers, when they come into the U.S. for their Sino-Soviet Muslim invasion. And I talk about in my book. But as we see the war now taking place, this is a war primarily against the Shia, and it's being financed by the Sunni gigatrillionaires of Kuwait, of the United Arab Emirates and of Saudi Arabia. Tell us a little bit about uh, some of the Jesuit conspiracies. Now, obviously, I've read through Vatican Assassins, and um, there's there's a lot of very famous conspiracies. And what one of the things that I have found is that they the, the Jesuits tend to have a bit of an ego where they will whitewash and overly whitewash one of their uh, major conspiracies with lots of um, Hollywood films that they spend lots of money making. Um, I, I wonder if you could take us through some of the more um, popularly known tragedies that have been fronted, or, or covertly, I should say, by the Jesuits slash Roman Catholic Church. Some of the more important conspiracies that they've been involved in is the, the Titanic. Yes. The Jesuits brought down the Titanic because there were certain people, specifically certain Jews, on the Titanic that were against the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, J.P. Morgan. Remember, J.P. Morgan was the Jesuit coadjutor, big American banker at the time. He's the founder of U.S. Steel. Uh, he, he buys U.S. Steel from Andrew Carnegie, the Jew Andrew Carnegie, for $100 million, less than what it's really worth. Morgan hated Carnegie. 
And then uh, Morgan will be also be responsible for using one of the Pope's court Jews, Paul Orberg, to uh, help in writing the Federal Reserve Act, of which they're all going to do down in, in, in Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. And then when the Federal Reserve Act is passed by stealth on, on December 23rd, 1913, due to the treason of Woodrow Wilson, the Jesuits then will ultimately have complete control of the American financial institutions and Wall Street because it's their bank. So it doesn't belong to the Jews. The Jesuits use certain court Jews to front it. But it's a nice amount of running that bank. Men like G. Peter G. Uh, uh, G. Peter Jeterson, uh, G. Peter Peterson, uh, and Peter G. Peterson, and uh, William McDonald. Both of them Knights of Malta. Both of them former heads of the New York uh, Federal Reserve Bank. So the Jesuits were behind the Titanic. I covered this in Chapter 35 of my book. Another one was the assassination of not only Kennedy and his brother Robert, but the assassination of Malcolm X. Wow. I'm, the, I'm the first guy that showed that Cardinal Spillman oversaw the assassination of Malcolm X because Malcolm X was a legitimate, true leader of American black people. And if there's anything the American blacks, and American whites for that matter, are not allowed, is a real leader. The Jesuits also killed Martin King. which They killed Martin King because he started to oppose Cardinal Spillman's Vietnam War. And uh, what's his name? Uh, Jesse Jackson is a part of the murder. So they just had him take his place. So the Jesuits are carrying out these assassinations and these destructions. They also carried out the, the demolition of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with their atomic devices on the ground. No atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Magnesium flash bombs were dropped. Uh, the one over Hiroshima was laced with uranium. The one over Nagasaki was laced with plutonium, so it made it look like a, an atomic bomb, really air burst, which had never happened. But the true uh, electromagnetic pulse devices, what we would call atomic bombs, were assembled on the ground in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, detonated. The Jesuits were underneath it. The bomb went out, but up, but not down. And the five, five Jesuits surfaced from ground zero, uh, attributing their survival to a miracle of the Virgin Mary. Yeah. That's unbelievable. So, yeah. Wow. So anyway, so, so the Jesuits, they have designed the entire uh, airborne nuclear war hoax. There is no such thing as airborne nuclear war. All we have ever happened is on-ground detonations. So the airborne nuclear war hoax was their design. Then, of course, that birthed the Cold War hoax, which is East is West, and then mutual assured destruction, all that nonsense. The Jesuits were all behind this, controlling the intelligence community, CIA, KGB, of every faction. So the Jesuits have made many, many movies on these kinds of things. Um, another one was, of course, the Boer War, if you want to get in that. Yeah, please. Absolutely. Uh, you know, South Africa is um, a country that's obviously my place of birth, and there's so much going on down there that um, a lot of people don't understand. And along with sort of, you know, how how the Jesuits have been involved with sort of uh, things like apartheid in order to create um, struggle and strife within the country. So I really do want to cover all that, please. The Jesuits hated the Boers. The Boers were Protestants and Calvinists. And they were a combination of the Dutch, French, and German. And that's why they had their special African language, Afrikaans language. Well, the Boers sought to escape the Inquisition of Rome and Europe, so they set out on their trip, and they were Dutch at the time, so they sent out, they came down to Cape of Good Hope, to Cape Town, and then they went inland. And the Boers founded what later became the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. And they didn't steal the land from the Zulus. They paid for that land. And it was the Zulu chief, as I document on my website, who shed first blood. He started killing the boys. He killed the leader of the boys. They didn't do anything to him. They just wanted a place to worship God. So therefore, that led to the Battle of Red River, where some, what, 15,000 savage Zulus were killed because they sought to kill all the boys. God protected the boys, giving them superior weapons and superior marksmanship and superior uh, um, martial abilities. Then the Zulus made friends with the boys, and the boys acted as their mercenaries, in exchange for land. So they would kill, they would go to war with the Zulu's black enemies in exchange for land. So the Zulu chiefs would give the Boers more land, and which is fine. So you have the Orange Free State, 
and the Transvaal, which is white Protestant Calvinistic, utterly accursed by the Jesuits. So therefore, how are the Jesuits going to get to the Boers? They're going to get to the Boers through England. Because you see, the Jesuits took over the British Empire no later than 1760, when King George III came to power. Everything King George did was benefited the Jesuit order. That's why he waged war against the Protestant Calvinists, the white Protestant Calvinists, the American colonists. He sought to reduce us to the Anglican Church, and he also sought to incite a servile war of the blacks to kill off the whites in North America. And Jefferson wrote of this, and he was going to make it an article in the Declaration of Independence, but he was not allowed to put it in. I have it on my website. I have it in my concon. So therefore, in the, in the Jesuit order's design to destroy the Reformation worldwide, they set out to get to the Boers. And so what they did was, is they, they incited the British, or they incited the British to kill the Boers in the First Boer War and the Second Boer War. Queen Victoria was completely in the hands of the Vatican. She opens up diplomatic relations with the Vatican in 1885. The English branch of the Knights of Malta is founded about this time. Queen Victoria, with her with her uh, Prime Ministers uh, Viscount Palmerston and Disraeli, are both busy serving the Pope, using the British Empire and the flower of British manhood to destroy the Protestants of South Africa. Well, the Boers, uh, to begin with, they won. They were they whipped the British pretty stoutly. And, uh, but still, the Vatican set out to completely destroy that empire. So they absorbed South Africa and, and, the, British, and, the, and the Dutch states there. And ultimately, the Boers still wanted to revolt against this. So they started their, they had their Dutch Republic. They had their South African Republic under Henry Verward. Henry Verward was, I believe, from the Netherlands also. He was reformed. He was a righteous white man and a Calvinist. So Henry Verward knew this, so he had not only had apartheid or racial separation, but he also was for the creating of a new black nation within South Africa and a new white nation, which, uh, oh no, the Jesuits will not allow this. So what does Henry Verward get? He gets a knife in the South African parliament, blood all over everywhere, and the Jesuits running the South African, South African government do not allow the rug to be changed for four years. The bloody blood stains of Henrik Verward are going to be seen for four years as a warning to anybody in South Africa that wants to have their new white Protestant nation. That cannot be allowed to happen. Wow. Just like a, a black Protestant nation cannot be allowed to happen in the nation of Liberia. So that is the story of South Africa. And now what we're having here is the Jesuits in control of Nelson Mandela. Remember, Nelson Mandela killed 40,000 blacks. And his witch of a wife was involved in that, Winnie. Uh, Nelson Mandela is a mass murderer and killer of not only blacks but whites. He is a knight of Malta of the English branch, made a knight of Malta by Queen Elizabeth II. That, that whore of the Pope. And that's right, she's the dame of Malta, um, dame of the Order of the Garter. She kisses the ring of the Pope. She's a complete and total slave. And this is where I teach people, this is the Pope's white power structure. This is the international white power structure destroying white Protestant nations, uh, black peoples that are Protestant also, like Liberia, because the temporal power of the Pope must be restored, and if that's going to happen, there can be no nation born out of the Protestant Reformation anywhere on the face of the earth. This is what's happened to Rhodesia. Rhodesia has been totally destroyed by forced miscegenation. Rabbi Mugabe was trained by Jesuits. Rabbi Mugabe is a member of the Order of the Garter. Robert Mugab, Mugabe uh, is the friend of Queen Elizabeth II, and he's a servant of the Pope. His policy was to kill out or drive out all the whites of Rhodesia, a.k.a. Zimbabwe. And now since this has happened, Zimbabwe is a poverty-stricken, broken, starving nation. And this is exactly what's going to happen in South, South Africa in five years. Although many of the white South Africans have left. I understand there's only two to three million left. They're being robbed, raped, and murdered by the, I call them the majority savage blacks of South Africa, run by uh, the African National Congress, encouraged by that wicked Bishop Tutu, that Jesuit, and that wicked uh, South African President Zuma. 
They're all busy killing off the historic white Anglo-Saxon Protestants of South Africa, which made South Africa the wealthiest and greatest nation in all of Africa. Johannesburg was the wealthiest city in all of Africa because it was white, it was, it was successful in business and diamonds and gold and so on. The Jesuits will not allow that. So now they're busy killing off all the whites. And the whites that cannot escape South Africa are all going to die within the next five to ten years. This is nothing more than the Jesuit orders of the Reformation. Using the blacks to do it. And they're not only doing it in South Africa. They're doing it right here in America. They're doing it in Canada. They're doing it in Australia. They're doing it in England. They're doing it in every historic white Protestant na nation because there can be no more nation that is white, that is Protestant, that adheres to the Reformation Bible, and that has a, has a middle class. All those nations must cease to exist. And hence, now we understand what the Jesuits have done in South Africa. Can I ask you, just so we can clarify, the Jesuits don't really give a damn what race um, is fighting on their behalf as long as it's on their behalf. Is that correct? That's correct. That's absolutely right. And they will use one race to drive out another race so long as um, they basically have a real system of if you're their enemy, they don't, they, they'll do, it doesn't matter what color you are, who you are, they'll just get rid of you. That's right. But remember, they especially hate the whites, the whites who are historic Protestants and Baptists because it's the, I maintain the most evil men in the world are white and the best men in the world are white. It's the white men of the Reformation that broke the Pope's temporal power and gave the world in 1648 the modern era where we had freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, and freedom of press. And so therefore the greatest enemy of the Pope's white power structure are white race nations that were historically Protestant. But when you usurp, when you usurp a white nation's government that was historically Protestant like Britain, and like America, you then use those armies of those nations to destroy your enemies that you want. This is why the Jesuits used the, the Yankee Union Army after the war between the states to wage a 25-year war on the American Indians of North America and confine the survivors to, to, uh, to, uh, to their little plantations or their little, uh, what do they call reservations. So they could build an empire, I call it the 14th Amendment American Empire, they could build their empire from sea to shining sea. So that's right, they don't care about any race of people. They're out to, whatever races they're destroying, they're out to restore the Pope's temporal power by doing so, but especially the white peoples of historic Protestant nations. Yeah. That's, that's pretty scary, actually. Um... So basically what you're saying is that within, say, five to ten years, um, the black people will pr pretty much have run the white people out of South Africa. Does that that's include right. uh, the sort of Catholic white people? That's, uh, that's correct. The Catholic whites are just as doomed. Because remember, the Jesuits will kill as many Catholic, uh, the, uh, Catholic people just to get to the Protestants. That's what they did in Vietnam. That's what they did, uh, uh, that's what they have done around the world. That's what they did in World War II. They decimated Germany to kill the Protestant Prussians, and that also included the decimation of Roman Catholic Munich. So they'll kill their own white Roman Catholic people just to kill the white Protestants. And one more thing I want to mention, I was a, a South African gentleman came to see me just last weekend. He told me, he told me that if you say anything negative about a black in South Africa, your wife and daughter will be raped, guaranteed. He said, he said Johannesburg is the rape capital of the world. Uh, it's a continual rape. Of st st uh, he says there's not one white family in South Africa that hasn't been raped, robbed, or murdered. Not one. And see, we, we can't talk about this on the press. We can't talk about, about this on, on Fox News or CNN. We can't even talk about this on alternative news media because the moment you bring, bring out these facts, why, wow, you're a racist. Oh, no, I'm not a hateful racist. I'm telling people the truth whether they like it or not. And there are certain black people that thank me for this. I had a black South African. Uh, sent me an email and said, I invited him on my broadcast. He's a Christian man. And I said, what's wrong with you black Christians? Why don't you stand up for these white people in South Africa? We'd be mass murdered. He said to me, if I came on your broadcast air, within 24 hours, I would be killed. Yeah. This is the power of the Jesuits over the ANC. And the ANC having driven all the blacks of South Africa into their radical, socialist, communist, white man hating party. That was the purpose of Mandela, to kill 40,000 blacks to instill fear and terror in them to all 
join the ANC so they can ultimately wipe out the whites of South Africa. And when that happens, you have no more food production. And so the blacks of South Africa, just like the blacks of Rhodesia or Zimbabwe, are starving to death. Let me ask you, Brother Eric, um, was Mandela um, a papal puppet from the beginning? Or do you reckon yes, they got to him when he was in jail? No, no, he was from the beginning. And they put him in jail to create an international sympathy for him. Well, there's it's actually, incredible. there's proof that, he, you know, on Robben Island that he didn't actually live in a cell. He lived in a mansion on the island. Oh, okay. I never heard that. Thank you for telling me. So he lives in a mansion on the island while he's quote-unquote in prison. Busy, working for the... But remember, you know, he was the utter stooge of Bishop Tutu. The Anglican Bishop Tutu. Bishop Tutu was a formal, formidable gesture. You know, a, I, I know a former bishop, Roman Catholic bishop, who got saved, Gerard Buffard. He knew Bishop Tutu when he was a priest in South Africa. He said he has pictures of Tutu with the Jesuits. So tell me, uh, B Bishop Tutu, is he actually then, because he seems to be like, as a South African, when we look at him, he seems to be like the highest ranking religious leader in South Africa. Would he then be uh, more powerful than, say, our president? Of course. Remember, the government of the world is that the Pope rules the churches and the churches rule the state. When you have unification of church and state like you do in South Africa. And so Tutu, being an Anglican bishop, is, not, is a servant to the Archbishop of Canterbury. James, James, well, no, just, I guess he just recently changed. And the Archbishop of Canterbury is a slave of the Pope. To conquer a nation, you conquer its church, its state and church first. Once you got that, you got everybody. And that's what they did in South Africa. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because um, I recently just released a book called The South African Guide to the Global Conspiracy and um, the angle I go at, because of course you know the conspiracy um, realm is so huge and there are a lot of, of course disinformation out there which I'll get on to talk with you in a bit, but um, most importantly with my book I have in fact heavily nailed home the Jesuit angle because to me I, I, I strongly feel that you cannot attack the truth of the conspiracy of South Africa without actually um, you know going through the Jesuits because as you say Robert Mugabe born and raised in Katuma Jesuits mission we've got um, Fort Hari University which was a Jesuits mission at first then turned into university you've got Nelson Mandela who's gone through this university you've got um, Thabo Mbeki's father who is of course the ANC's um, the president of our country as well he's also a knight of Malta he's gone through that university and um, so really um, just to bring to my point what I was about to say is that my book has now actually been suppressed in South Africa. Um, recently my um, publisher said that, you know, he, after having printed all the books and delivered a copy to my mother in her hand, um, he actually um, was threatened because I very specifically go into the Jesuit information. Yep. And he's well, now... You know, by the way, you, you send me your book and I will sell it on my website. I actually, do you know what, because it was suppressed, it's been put onto the banned books list in South Africa, um, what I've done is I've decided not to sell it, uh, because I believe that information should be made available to people. If they're trying to suppress it, it obviously means it's got some value, in which case right. I must do as much as I can to get it out there, and I'm not going to put a price tag on the information. Okay, so, well yeah, make it, a, make it a download or something, but you see, not only the white people of South Africa got to know this, the black people got to know it too. But this is it. You the won't blacks, believe how many... Finished. They are finished if the white people are destroyed out of South Africa. And this is what they need to know, is that, you know, it's not the white people that are the enemy or the black people that are the enemy. It's actually, right. at the end of the day, it's those people who are ignorant of what's really going on um, that are the biggest enemy. It, it really is about empowering ourselves with knowledge, realizing the power we have, we actually all come together and doing something about it. That's right. And you, and you also have to realize that London and Washington are your greatest enemies. They're going to seek to prevent what's going to the, the final consummation of what's going on in South Africa. So you have to realize the Queen and the American President are your enemies and they're going to do anything they can to, to, to further this destruction of South Africa. Yeah. Well, Brother Eric, don't you worry. I'll be sending you the link and you can put it on your website if you wouldn't mind. People can download yeah, it and read it. Happy to. Thank you very, very much. Of course, that would be a great help to us. Um, the, the other thing that, um, of course, I wanted to speak to you about, which I find very interesting, is, of course, there is a lot of uh, Vatican control. In fact, Vatican controls the media. All right. Um, now, there's a lot of... Uh, Vatican control as well in the alternative media. I've, I've categorically traced 
the Vatican control of people like Alex Jones. Oh, now you're going to get real controversial. Well, you know what? Do you know what, Brother Eric? That's good. I love, I, I be honest with you, the reason I'm so excited to have you on my show is I think you're the only person that shares the same opinion on me as the same figures in the alternative media, bearing in mind that as I said, my book has been banned, so I'm, I'm pretty much got the same view as you on things, okay? okay? I do believe that there are certain figures that need to be discussed, uh, right. because there is traceable, real evidence that I can prove links them to the Vatican. And I wanted yep. to, to talk to you about this. For example, I, I have categorically proven um, um, Alex Jones, and I wanted to, uh, you've mentioned David Icke yep. before. Let's talk David Icke, uh, Jesuit co-editor. That's right. David Icke doesn't want to take you to Rome. David Icke doesn't want to blame the Jesuits. I saw a video on him where he says, uh, he said, you said something about the Pope. He said, I never said that about the Pope. David Icke, I maintain David Icke is heavily involved with British intelligence. And British intelligence has been controlled by Rome for, for 200 years. And he wants to get your attention. You, you will focus on Scottish Rite Freemasonry, of course, that's good. But I never tell you that the headquarters of Scottish Rite Freemasonry is in the Piazza del Jesu in Rome, right next door to the Jesuits' mother church, the Jesu. He will not tell you that in the Masonic ring with the G in the center, it doesn't stand for generation or gnosticism, it stands for Jesu. Even F. Tupper Saucy brings that out in his work, uh, Rulers of Evil, and he was a Jesuit coacher. So, no, David Icke is one most assuredly. Until he comes out and starts attacking Rome and, 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 and not blaming the Jews in particular, he starts, you know, he starts to want to say, it's the Jews serving the Pope that we need to focus on here in this particular instance. When he wants to start doing those things, and I withdraw my charge, but until such time, he is most assuredly a Jesuit coach. Thank you very much, Brother Eric. We've said the exact same thing. To be honest with you, uh, he, we feel the same. The fact that he doesn't actually turn around and say that the Catholic Church controls the Zionists. He talks about the Zionists and the Jews as if, you know, they're a separate entity. That's one of the things I've said. And the fact that he, in his information, and this is, I have done, I've read, read every single one of his books. I've written reviews for his books, which is posted on his website. He sends books to my house once he's written them before they go out to anybody else. You know, like as, as people, one of the people who write reviews for him. So I get to see all his work, and I can tell you honestly that he never ever goes into the Jesuits, ever. He doesn't, he's never in his 20 books, 700 pages, some of them, ever published the extreme myth of the Jesuits. That's right. And, and if you wonder, because you see, he's British. Yeah. Do you realize what the, what the hell the Jesuits have put the British through? St. Bartholomew, or you have the, uh, the gunpowder plot of 1605. That almost blew up King James and the entire British Parliament. You have war after war that they get the British involved in. You, you have the, the Jesuits taking over the, the crown, and by, by George V, that night of Malta, he's going to uh, participate in World War I, and he's going to use General Haig in World War I, Marshal Haig, to order the flower of white Protestant British manhood into the face of German machine guns at Passchendaele and other places. The Jesuits have slaughtered the best of British manhood using the crown to do it. And Ike knows all about it, but he's not going to say a word about it. Yeah. I definitely get the sensation that um, I've, I've uh, interviewed him twice in person. And um, I must certainly get the idea that he knows a lot more than he's letting on, particularly when he started talking about how they wanted to build a second, temp uh, the third temple in Jerusalem. And now, how would he know that unless he was in on this information? He was really, he was talking about it, and then I started to question him, and he became very vague, and I found this suspicious. This third temple in Jerusalem really is the heart of what the Jesuit plan. That's right. That's why, well, you see, that's why the Jesuits have hoarded all the gold. Remember, they've hoarded all our American gold with FDR when he made it illegal, by executive order for Americans to hold gold. what they do? They melted it all down, all the coins down, they put it in Fort Knox, because we've been under emergency war power since March 6, 1933. And then after that, the gold was moved uh, during a 17-year period to the basement of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York City, which is the Post Bank. And FDR, in 1934, gave legal title to all of our American gold to the Federal Reserve Bank. So they now have hoarded all the gold of America, as well as every other country, and they're going to use that gold, they're going to use it as, as uh, part of their beautifying of the Third Temple in Jerusalem. 
And so the Jews are going to be blamed by the world. Look what they did. They hoarded all of our gold. That's our gold in Jerusalem when it's the Vatican that has done it, when it's the Jesuits that have done it, because the Jesuits are seeking to create worldwide anti-Jewish fury to ultimately attack and kill every Jew in Israel one day. Okay, so now, something I'm very curious um, to, to ask about. Uh, I've been uh, campaigning heavily uh, on regards to justice for children. As you know, there is, it's very open now. It's um, about the pedophilia scandal and the abuse of children within the Roman Catholic Church, which I think has been the fundamental breaking point uh, for them. Okay, I agree. Uh, on everything. I think this is now, it's come out to such a great degree and it's now so openly publicized and we've got people like uh, the wonderful Reverend Kevin Annett who's taking these people on um, yeah. and, and exposing them, which, I, you know, we had Kevin Annett on a few weeks ago. So we're working closely with him with his work. We obviously have huge support and respect for what he's doing. Um, but now, I, I, I was interested to know, um, Brother Eric, I don't really still get the whole necessity for abusing and hurting children and why it's so prolific within the Roman Catholic Church. Why, what is this, what is this, uh, is it part of their culture? Is it part of their ritual? Is, is it written in their doctrines? Why has it become such an institutional practice that's been going on for so long and it's only been exposed now when it's such a horrific thing? Well, <clears throat> see I believe a lot of these Roman Catholic priests are demon-possessed. Yeah. And so therefore, I don't put anything by them. Um, it's not in their doctrine to be pedophiles. But it's part of the... It's part of the degradation of Roman Catholic manhood so that they will ultimately submit to the rule of the priest when they become men. I maintain that's the reason why. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So uh, it, it has to do with power. It has to do with subjugation. And, of course, these young boys that have been raped by the priests, they don't want to talk about it because it's such a shameful topic. And so they have one of two choices, either to talk about it and risk losing their family ties, because how dare you talk against the church like that, or to go along with it and be placed in positions of power, of wealth, and academia, and, and politics. And so, unfortunately, it's, it's gone on for like this for some time, where these men that have been uh, traumatized, that's what it is, it's abused and traumatized sexually, that uh, the papacy has succeeded. And so remember the Vatican cut off the testicles of uh, little boys so they could sing in their, their uh, boys' choir so they could have high voices. That only was, that only was outlawed in the 1950s. Wow. So there's anything they won't do. Nothing. Nothing. So this is part of their subjugation and control of the population. And when a population no longer is able to resist them with guns and with private wealth, and they hence through the political arena, what are they going to do? It's, it's everywhere in South America. Pedophilia everywhere. Because those people, there's no guns. They don't have a voice in, in government to overthrow this tyranny in South America. They're conquered, and that's exactly what they want for all the other historic fledging white Protestant nations. Look what that could happen in Ireland. Those poor Irishmen testifying, he buggered me. And then the Irish Prime Minister telling the Vatican, you are, your priests are going to be subject to the same laws we are. And then the Vatican withdrew its ambassador, its papal nuncio from Ireland. I said, praise God. Good for the Catholic Irish. They're finally doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of good work going on like that all over the world at the moment. Just people just waking up to what's real, and and it's great. And people are just really going. You know, we've had enough of this, and we're not. And it's it's despicable. We won't put up with it anymore. Uh, just back to sorry. I, I know we're jumping a bit around uh, again. Just off topic. Um, early on, I was speaking about David Icke. Um, are there any other particular people? One thing I don't, I really, really don't appreciate is false prophets, because I do believe the truth sets you free, as the Bible says. Um, I'd really like your opinion, because I value it highly, Brother Eric, as to um, people who you've come across who are, are pre pretending to do good, but really are just adding to the confusion. There are no prophets. So anybody who purports to be one is a liar like Harold Camping, who said that, oh, the end of the world is going to come, what, in October 1st or something, or sometime during 2011, it didn't happen, yeah. and now it makes, it makes Christians look like fools. Well, I denounced that sinner from the very time he started with his 1994. Completely unbiblical, absolutely wrong, 
And, and Christ said that we are not to set any date for his coming. We are not date setters. There's nothing in the Bible that gives any man a right to set a date. And if you notice in my work, I never give a date for anything. I just say, according to the Bible, this next event, but I'll never say, I never say this is going to be the last pope. I don't believe this one is going to be the last pope. There's going to be several more popes because the temple has to be built. There's going to be a temple in Babylon built. There has to be a complete European unity. The Reformation is going to be destroyed. There's, there's a bunch of things that have to happen yet. Yeah, so I, but I never, ever give a, a time or a date whenever I speak. Okay. And in terms of alternative media, um, people like Alfred Weber? Is he a Vatican co is he a, an actual Jesuit coadjutor? Sure is. He's not a Malta. His uncle was a Jesuit, an advisor to the Black Pope. Wow. And I called him that, and he publicly denounced me, and he helped put a, a defaming article up written by a, a couple other guys. But yeah, he really hated me for calling him a Knight of Malta. And I found it out through a mutual friend that, that, that approached him on this, and he admitted that his uncle was a Jesuit. Alfred Weber is working for the papacy. That's why he calls for the abolition of the U.S. Constitution. And now, it's, as Alfred Weber has kind of infiltrated the same sort of truth movement that David Icke seems to be heading up, um, are there any other uh, sort of people in that movement who are directly linkable to the Vatican? Stan Monteith is. Now, Stan Monteith's always been nice to me, but he was a member of the Council for National Policy for years. He said he's no longer a member. I have another source that says he's a Knight of Malta. But he gets people on his broadcast for their Opus Dei, and he's very, and he's civil and, 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 and supporting, I should say. He's supporting to these Opus Dei guests. Opus Dei was created by the Jesuits in 1928 for, for the purpose of destroying uh, any, any revolt. And, uh, that would rise up like in, uh, like in Spain when the Spanish kicked out the Jesuits in 1931, 1932. Franco used Opus Dei to wage his civil war, killing two million Spanish people for the Pope. Opus Dei was all part of this. Pinochet is his right-hand man and, and, and what, in Chile. He was Opus Dei. Pinochet was uh, Nato Malta. So when you got Monteith having Opus Dei on his broadcast, and he has nothing but good to say and encourage people to... That's all nonsense. So I tend, and he never, never really goes off into the Jesuits, I mean, because he told one of my friends that he says he has a lot of Catholic supporters. Well, isn't that too bad? The Catholics are entitled to the truth. And if you're going to tell the truth that they want to support you, that's fine. But if not, that's fine too. But he will not go to the Vatican and say that it's the heart of everything. He always blames the Anglo-American uh, power structure. His, I quote his book, Brotherhood of Death, in my book. He has several good things to show that the Bolsheviks were not run by the Jews and that the American governments financed the Bolsheviks, etc. But he never, never hammers the Vatican. When I was at the 2008 ConCon uh, in Santa Clara, he came to where I was at and he was nice to me. We spoke a little bit. He's a very civil gentleman. But he's not going to take you to Rome. He's one. And we might as well go to the entire RBN network. RPM won't tell you about the Jesuits. I was invited several times to be on my friend Bill Deagle's show, and I said uh, that I'm going to deal with the Jesuits. I don't care who it is. And then I called Alex Jones, a Jesuit co-tutor, and Dr. Deagle told me that I'm, I'm going to have to recall that, or I'm not going to be on his program anymore. So I'm sorry, Doc. I mean, I like your, your friend, but I'm going to announce Jones as a co-tutor. So he didn't have me on for a while. Then he contacted me back and said, Eric, I'm sorry for what I said. I'd like to have you back. I said, okay, that's fine. But... You know, I don't think today he's hammering Jones because he's on, on really Alex Jones' alternative radio station. So I, I, I like the doc, but I think there's some sort of problem there. And then you got Sean Morton, uh, Sean Morton, uh, uh, did, uh, Sean David Morton. Sean David Morton, working with George Norton. Both of them are Jesuit co -leaders. Now, Sean David Norton was nice to me. Sean uh, David Morton was nice to me at the 2008 ConCon. Con. He gave me a copy of his book, Black Cherith which was a story about a weapon that had been created, a biological weapon to create, to kill all the Jews. That was his book. And uh, I gave him a copy of my CD, he gave him a copy of his book, but he's a Knight of Malta. John David Morton is a Knight of Malta. It's like Len Horowitz, he's another Knight of Malta, which he's presently suing me for calling him a Knight of Malta. I'm one of 50 defendants in the lawsuit, along with David Icke and Alex Jones and Anthony Hilder. He named all of us as as a, people that want to destroy his business and maligned him and so on. I just call him as an item altar because that's what he is. It's on his website. 
So you got all these people. I maintain the vast majority of them are Jesuit coadjutors. They all want to blame the Rothschilds or the Rockefellers or the Jews. They never take you home to Rome. They're never going to hammer the Jesuits. And this is a business for them, you see. This is how they make their money. And if they would start blaming the Vatican, they're not going to have a business anymore. They're going to have to go to work like I do. <laughs> so, I mean, this, this is a, this is a what, do you, what would you call it? It's a, it's a hobby for me because I can't make any money to do this. They, they pirated my book all throughout the world. <laughs> I make my mic sell one or two CDs a week. So, that's okay. At least the message is out. But these guys, they, they count on this as their livelihood. And so, if they would blame the Vatican, that would be the end of their business and their livelihood. Brother Eric, can I just say that I have been interviewing people for three years and right now you have just made me the happiest person that anybody has made me by saying that because I have been trying to make this point in the alternative media for so long and like yourself, I've been attacked uh, by, you know, David I've been the doyen of alternative media. I mean, a front page article calling me every name under the sun because I questioned uh, why he never goes into the Jesuits. And I've had the same repercussions. Again, as I said, I've now had to make my work available for free. I don't make money off anything that I do. And those people, and I've said the same thing, those people who are able to make a living off it, they clearly aren't attacking the Vatican. That's right. That's right. In my, in my public speakings, I make very little money. I've never made over a thousand bucks in any public speaking, ever. Every radio interview I've ever done has been for free. Every one of them. So therefore, hey, I just regard it as my duty. This is my Bible-believing Protestant Baptist Christian duty to inform the world of what's going on. So, but we also have to remember the words of Shakespeare. Remember Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, Lord Great Chamberlain to the Queen, who was really Shakespeare, not Francis Bacon. He said in one of his plays, Thou dost protest too strongly. And this is evidence of guilt. This is evidence of being a coadjutor. When somebody says, I think you're working for the Jesuits, instead of rationally going in, well, why would you say that? Well, here's why I said this, and this is why I say this. So I'm not, a, I'm not working for the Jesuits. But when you attack the person who, who merely tells about the Jesuits, then you're protesting too strongly. This is obvious evidence that you're in on it, and hence David Icke and Jones and all these other sinners are in on the bandwagon. By the way, Alex Jones is a very wealthy man, and, I'll, and you tell me where he gets all the money for that website. Well, I'll be honest with you, uh, Brother Eric, I've done extensive research on, on, on Alex Jones. His, uh, um, his network, Gemini Communications Network, is owned by ABC Disney, which is in, then in turn owned by the CIA, which we can prove we chase the link. But not only that, he likes to have Pat Buchanan, Knight of Malta, as a regular guest and contributor to a show. Yeah, and remember this also, that the, that the council, that the advisory board for Disney has some 17 men on it and a man that was on it for years. For years, Leo J. O'Donovan was the Jesuit priest and the president of Georgetown University. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. So, um, you know, this is it. I, I've said, to, uh, I myself have worked in mainstream media and I know what it goes. P people who don't understand look at Alex Jones every day and go, do you know how much it takes for that production, for his researchers, his production team to put out that amount of information that often? Yeah, it takes yeah. a hell of a lot to run that network. Yeah, where yeah, he's, not getting it from, he's not getting it from donations. That's right. Not at all. And he's not writing his own articles. I, I write every one of my articles that's on my website. And when I don't, I put the name of the guy who did, like Rob Hilson. No, he's, and he also is able to go on Fox News. Now, this is very important. The Jesuits' right-wing uh, movement to create the new Nazi right-wing in America, the spokesman for that is Fox News. You have all these radical right-wing Roman Catholics on there, like Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly and a host of others, and they have they have legitimate grievances, but the results are never what they should be done, naming state secession and cutting away from Washington. We have to get something new going on in Washington. So the whole new right started by Knight of Malta, J. Peter Grace, with Paul Weyrick and, and a host of others that were subject to Rome, uh, the former head of Rite Aid, Louis Lerman, that Jew, became a Roman Catholic and not a Malta, owner of Rite Aid. They were, these men were all creators of the new radical right-wing movement in America that is culminating in the Tea Party movement. And all those white people have legitimate grievances, but they're being sucked into the radical right-wing movement that will ultimately bring about a new Nazi fascist military dictator that will kill every Jew in North America. So this is the end game. Fox News is behind it. And Fox News has host Alex Jones many times. Mm -hmm. He's been hosted by Geraldo Rivera, Jerry Rivers, 
who is a court Jew working for the Pope, and he was in on the Kennedy assassination cover-up. That's why they made him a announcer every year after that, for every year after that, just like they did with uh, Dan Rather. And what's an interesting thing that I, I wanted to talk about is um, this Bohemian Grove. A lot of people don't understand the Catholic connection. The Bohemian Grove was started by the Jesuits. Their patron saint is is a uh, man who refused to tell what was, was confessed in the confessional. I cover this in my... Uh, yeah, in my, uh, I think it's from John of Nepomuk, isn't it? That's right. He's the patron saint. And he's championed by the Jesuits. Championed by them. The other thing is, Bohemian Grove was... Um, was started, it was created just 60 miles north of the Jesuit Order's military fortress in San Francisco. And that military fortress is the University of San Francisco. The University of San Francisco is run by Jesuits. They control the Archbishop of San Francisco, who was once Levada. He's now the head of the Inquisition in Rome. And the Bohemian Grove is the place where the Jesuits go to engage in their orgies and high worship and human sacrifice. The, this is obviously the, the dark heart of the beast, this, this sacrifice and orgy. Now, this is, as you said, this is all d demonic. This, um, th this is the other connection I wanted to bring in here, is that um, the guy who deals with um, extraterrestrial matters within the Vatican, who runs all these extraterrestrial conferences on their behalf, is also the same guy, I think his name is Bonaducci, who is their um, t t uh, chief demonologist. Is, is there uh, some kind of link there, do you think, Brother Eric? Of course. Eric? Oh, of course. Remember, the Jesuits are the masters the, of, of, of demonology and of Satanism. They're the masters. The devil has consolidated all of his power into the hands of the Jesuits. And just one more thing, uh, Brother Eric. Uh, Hollywood as well. Um, the Oscar is actually the shape of a knight. Mm -hmm. What sort of... Um, hold or effect uh, is the Vatican, you know, what is the sort of connection there? Well, Hollywood is, has been controlled by the, the, the papacy since its inception. One of the original founders of Hollywood was Knight of Malta, Joe Kennedy. Now the Jews were very much involved to begin with, but in the 30s, Kennedy consolidates all power of those particular cinemas into the hands of the papacy. He becomes the leading knight of Malta over Hollywood. Remember, he's one of the major controllers of Paramount Pictures. Joe Kennedy, at the time, Hitler was coming to power because Joe Kennedy and, and Prescott Bush Sr., these knights of Malta, they were busy bringing Hitler to power. Uh, Joe Kennedy told the Jews in Hollywood, the Jewish playwrights, to not say anything negative about Hitler. And they all followed Kennedy's orders. Hollywood is completely in the hands of the Jesuits. Uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, who I understand is a personal admirer, he said to the Count, he said, all that run Hollywood are the homosexuals and the Catholics, specifically the Knights. The Count's father was a Knight of Malta. He was involved in working in Hollywood. And you have other famous uh, people in Hollywood, like, uh, like Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and Sylvester Stallone and Tom Cruise. And uh, Anthony, Anthony, uh, uh, what's that? Anthony uh, Hopkins, uh, and then the list goes on and on. All the, Sidney Portier, Sidney Portier is an Adam Malta and a Knight of the Equestrian Order. All these, Sammy Davis Jr. was an Adam Malta. All the men that I just mentioned, you were all Knights of Malta, all busy working for the papacy through what they produce in Hollywood. Wow. Well, Brother Eric, this has been an absolutely riveting conversation and uh, uh, we've come to the end of it, unfortunately. But I would just like to say thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, we have a lot to mull over and I look forward to getting this interview up on video form. So thank you very much from all of us here in the Netherlands and at Freedom Central and also from all the people uh, who have listened in. Um, they've been absolutely riveted with this information. So thanks a lot and um, I hope to catch up with you again soon. Sounds wonderful, Melanie. Lord bless. God bless you too, Brother Eric. We'll speak soon.